So our next speaker, um, who's here both virtually and um, via recording, is Pedro Salas, um, and he's talking about the laser surface scanning instrument LASI. So let's take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm Pedro Salas, a postdoc at the Green Bank Observatory, and today I would like to share with you the work we have been doing in the development of the Laser Antenna Surface Scanning Instrument, LASI. I would like to introduce you to the instrument, show you some examples of results obtained with it, and tell you about our plans for commissioning during the winter. So, what is LASI? Well, it is a Leica scan station P40 installed on top of the receiver kind of the GVT. From there, it can scan the primary reflector at any elevation. The project was part of the first Argos 144 proposal, and it was the only part that got funded in that opportunity by the NSF. What do we want to do with this instrument? Well, we want to measure the formations of the GVT's primary reflector, so we can conduct high frequency observations with the GVT. And we want to measure these deformations as well as out of focus holography, which is the method currently in use for this purpose. But we want to do this faster and also be able to do this during day or night and at any elevation. In this diagram, we're showing where LASI is installed. There is a beam on top of the receiver cabin. And from there, LASI hangs upside down, which enables it to see the whole primary reflector. From this position, though, it cannot see the secondary mirror of the telescope. For this reason, the instrument will not deliver pointing corrections. We're only going to be interested we're mainly interested in the formations of the primary. Since we're using a scanner, if, for example, the telescope is vibrating, the scans are going to have artifacts. Or if it's a foggy night, then we're not going to see the dish. As purchased, the scanner is accurate down to one millimeter, this can be calibrated and the accuracy improved, but what we're doing instead is using differential measurements. So instead of scanning the surface and comparing it to an ideal paraboloid to determine how much it is deformed, what we're going to do is compare scans for this. What we're going to do in practice then is use out-of-focus holography to correct the surface and bring it to as close to a paraboloid as possible and scan the surface using LASI, creating what is known as a reference scan. And then whenever an observer wishes to correct the surface, he can scan again using LASI and then these two scans will be compared and the deformations can be measured from these two maps. In, this means that the level of accuracy that we can reach using LASI will be limited by the, the surface error during the reference scan, plus any errors that LASI introduces uh, due to its nature. For out-of-focus holography, we know that the surface error that we can reach is roughly 230 microns. And from the experiments we have been carrying with LASI, we have that the surface that the surface error it will additionally introduce is of the order of 100 microns. So we can expect that the total surface error using this method is going to be of the order of 250 microns. And regarding the reference scan, we still do not know how often we will need to update these uh, scans. And that's one of the things we are aiming to answer during this winter. We do not know if this is something we can do just only once during a winter, maybe longer or maybe shorter. 
Now I would like to show you some examples of uh, the scans taken with LASI. In all the cases, I will be showing differences between scans. And in this particular case, scans taken when there are no deformations introduced using the active surface. What we see in the X and Y coordinates, they are relative to the center of the dish rather than the scanner. The scanner in this case is at the bottom center of each panel and the red points show data that's coming out of your screen and blue going into your screen. On the left, what we have is a scan where we see clear radial artifacts. We know that the dish of the GVT never deforms to this kind of amplitudes. And what's happening here is that the structure is vibrating and this is picked up by the scanner. So instead of seeing the surface, what we're seeing is just um, artifacts due to the movement of the dish relative to the scanner. In the center and right panels, what we're seeing is the difference between scans taken three minutes apart. So in this case, rather than deformations of the dish, what we're seeing is mainly the range noise of the scanner. Since thermal deformations are not, are not large enough uh, on three minute scales, the difference uh, on these scans is mainly showing us the range error of the scanner. Additionally here, what you might notice are these white uh, spots on the surface of the dish. This is data that has been flagged. In particular, these big white circles are due to malfunctioning uh, actuators, which are easily picked out using LASI, and the smaller holes are, uh, and the smaller white spots are holes which give a clear view of reference retroreflectors under the surface of the telescope. These retroreflectors were used in the past to adjust the surface using photogrammetry, and now um, we're not interested in them, so we're just flagging them. What I'm showing now is again differences between scans, but in this case, we have introduced deformations using the active surface. Since we can command the active surface, we can introduce deformations that resemble what we will encounter during an, an observation, and we can use these to characterize the instrument. Here I'm showing three different deformations, and then we can compare what we told the active surface to do with what we're measuring using LASI to determine how well the scanner works and how well this, the method we're using works. This is shown here on the top panel where we have on the y-axis the measured deformation and on the x-axis the deformation introduced with the active surface. What we see are circles of different sizes and colors. In this case, the colors show different kinds of deformations and their sizes show the amplitude of these deformations. We also see a red line, which shows a one-to-one -one correlation between uh, input deformation and the measured one. And we see that most of the points lie very close or on top of the red line, meaning that we're measuring these deformations accurately enough. On the bottom panel, what we're seeing is the difference between the measured deformation and the input deformation. And again, we see that the points are roughly clustered around zero with a mean value of minus 17 microns plus minus 50 microns. This is close to the tolerance of the actuators when they are commanded, and it adds very little error to the, to the total surface error budget. 
if we look on the previous figure, we were only looking at the commanded deformations. But if we look at the total wavefront error introduced by the instrument, this sigma lassi here on the y-axis, we see that the, the, the total error of the instrument is a bit larger of the order of 100 microns. What I'm showing here is again circles of different sizes and colors. Uh, the sizes and colors are the same as in the previous slide. But now on the x-axis, what we have is time. So this shows that the deformations of the surface error introduced by the instrument does not change significantly over one night. During commissioning this winter, what we want to do is determine how often we will need to update the reference scans. We would also like to characterize the performance of LASI during the day, and most importantly, compare it with the performance of auto oof so that we can deliver uh, informed guidelines for the users on how and when to use LASI and in which situations it is better to use out of focus holography. And something which I'm really interested in is using the primary reflector as a reference for calibrating the scanner. With this, we should be able to bring down to improve the accuracy of the scanner and hopefully we would remove the need for a reference scan. And all this is going to take place uh, during this winter. So as a summary, LASI uses a terrestrial laser scanner to measure the formations of the primary reflector. During the last year, we have been able to see that we're able to measure the formations down to 60 microns over linear scales of hundreds of meters, particularly when the wind speeds are below four meters per second, which is also fortunately the limit for scheduling high frequency observations. And we expect that LASI will be operational during next year after we finish with the commissioning during this winter. Thanks for your attention and for listening. If you have any questions, I will try to answer them now. All right, so that concludes the recorded part of Pedro's talk. So Pedro, um, you're here. So could you please unmute yourself and say hi and turn on your video? Yes. Hi, everyone. All right, great. Um, so we had one question earlier in the meeting about the active surface rangefinder and the timeline. Um, you answered that in the chat and in the talk, but if that person has additional questions, please um, pop them in the chat box. Uh, so we have one question, how to deal with or discriminate mirror vibration due to wind and not geometrical deviations? Uh, in particular, vibrations that are not homogenous in the whole surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. And so far, what we what we see is that whenever there's vibration, these have a very clear signature, uh, meaning that the uh, that they are like sharp and radial in in nature. So, in principle, um, this should be easy to to discriminate by eye. Um, if what you're seeing is really just because of vibrations or if it is uh, a real deformation, which you expect to be much more smooth and uh, coherent over the whole surface of the telescope. In addition to this, what we're planning to do is include warnings uh, during the observations. So if you want to use LASI and you trigger LASI, uh, we will check for you what the well conditions are. And then uh, based on this uh, issue, uh, uh, a warning, for example, if we if we are measuring high wind speeds, we will let you know that, hey, usually for these wind speeds, uh, LASI does not behave well. And additionally, there will be 
some uh, requirement of user interaction with the uh, with the results where basically we're going to be displaying these maps and the user can check by eye um, how the, the data looks like and from this it should be uh, we hope easy enough to to identify if there's any uh, wind induced uh, artifacts or not on your data so if you can see if you need to take a, another scan or just uh, use a different method so in a related question we have, um, is there any thought about correcting for vibrations using the quadrant detector, an accelerometer, and other technique? Um, what we have is that the, the quadrant detector so far, it's not fast enough for correcting for this kind of uh, vibrations. Um, and there has been thought about uh, using an accelerometer on the, putting an accelerometer on the instrument to try to correct for this but we haven't really um, gone uh, down this avenue, mainly because um, we're only seeing these artifacts uh, or these artifacts are bad enough that, uh, that you would not want to use the instrument uh, when the wind conditions are also the, the conditions that would not allow you to, to carry out uh, high frequency observations. But uh, if, if we see that this is something that the that it's really needed, we would uh, certainly try to use an accelerometer for this. And so one last question, um, is there any plan to call for shared risk observations as part of the commissioning of LASI? Um, I, so far we haven't considered this option uh, during our internal uh, meetings but uh, thanks for pointing it out and that's uh, something we 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 will think about thanks thank you all right um so we're gonna well actually we have three minutes so i can actually ask one more so um i'm I think I'm going to, I think I got what the point of this question is, but I may not. So do you think artifacts are scaled to the wavelength dependent observations? Mm. So basically do the, the artifacts scale to the wavelength of the observation? And if you have 12 CO, are you worse off than trying to do HC and HCO plus? Um. Here, I'm, I'm guessing the, the question is about the artifacts uh, introduced by the scanner. Um, it, if that's the case, uh, no, um, th these are fixed uh, in wavelength since the, the, the scanner uses its own uh, laser, it's, uh, an infrared laser. So it, it's not dependent on which wavelength you're observing at. I hope that's what was asked. Yes, I, th I think it is. Uh, and if not, yes, um, yes. you can correspond with the, the, the question asker in, in the chat. Um, we also had a, a question about wind and the map. Um, so basically, if you have wind and uh, it moves around, the feed arm oscillates, um, does it affect the map quality by smearing the pointing? And then the answer is yes. Um, David is answering that in more detail. But uh, I know from my work is that when you have extended sources and the feed arm oscillates, um, you do get a, a smearing in the map.